Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle DeMarzo, the Fairfield University Art Museum Curator of Education and Academic Engagement. And thank you for joining me this evening to welcome photojournalist Robert Gerhardt, whose work is on view right now in the Bellarmine Hall Galleries in the exhibition, Robert Gerhardt, Mike Check. Uh, this is presented through December 18th, and we are delighted to say it is available to be visited Tuesday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. right here at Fairfield University. So we hope after hearing Rob's talk tonight that you will stop by and see this powerful exhibition. The COVID-19 policies of Fairfield University will apply, so you can visit our website, fairfield.edu museum, to learn more about those. As you're watching Robert's talk, he's generously invited audience members to leave questions in the chat box. He's happy to answer questions as he goes. If you have a question about a particular photograph, please drop one in there and we'll pass it along to him. Or you can wait until the end when I'll join him back on screen for a brief Q&A. Our guest this evening, Robert Gerhardt, is a member of the National Press Photographers Association in the United States and an absentee member of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong. He earned a bachelor's in anthropology, sociology, and art history from the College of the Holy Cross, and has an MFA in photography from the Lesley University College of Art and Design. His photographs have been included in numerous solo and group exhibitions in North America, Europe, and Asia, and in a number of public and private collections, including the Museum of the City of New York, the New York Historical Society, and the Arab American National Museum. His work has also been published both nationally and internationally, including in The Guardian, Diplomat, The New York Times, The Huffington Post, Newsweek, Haaretz, and Süddeutsche Zeitung. I hope you'll join me now in welcoming Robert Gerhardt. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me. And as um, was said before, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the box. Um, I have no problem sort of stopping talking to get going about individual photographs. Um, so I thought I would start off with a little bit of a background about me. Um, I was born in Augusta, Georgia in 1977, but I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I am the oldest of five kids. I have three younger sisters and a younger brother. Um, when I was in high school, I went to St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia, which is another Jesuit high school which sort of instilled in us the idea of being a man for others and sort of trying to tell stories and help those people that you that that you are able to. Um, that is my senior prom photo, just to do that one. As was said, I graduated from College of the Holy Cross in 1999 with a degree in sociology with a concentration in anthropology and a double major in art history. And while I was there, I had also taken a lot of photography courses. My anthropology advisor suggested on a whim that I take a photo class because back then with everything being manual cameras and film, to be able to do anthropological field work, you needed to know how to take a decent photograph. And on my first professor was a guy named Harold Feinstein, who was a New York street photographer from the 50s and 60s. And within a few days of him showing us his portfolio in class, I fell in love with the medium and sort of gave up everything else and became a photographer. Um, and while I was there, it was when I sort of also started studying photography and photographers and really looking at other photographers' work. Um, and my influences really started to come about. So just I'll talk about a few of them real quickly. Um, the first is Robert Frank, who sort of his work, particularly the Americans, where he got a couple of Guggenheim grants to photograph America in, in 1955 and 1956. Um, this is a shot from Memphis, Tennessee. There's sort of these black and white, very grainy, very um, documentary style shots of the United States at a sort of very pivotal time of the country's history in the mid 50s. Um, the idea of racism and all of this sort of stuff was still very much in this in in play. Why can't oh there we go? Um, another big influence on mine was a was Eugene Smith, who most of you may or may not have heard of. His his work, he was a big photographer for Life magazine, again through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, this is from one of his pieces he did on a country doctor who lived in Colorado. 
he did some work, a documentary project on Pittsburgh called Love Street, where he basically documented the entire city. He had been sent by Life magazine to do it over a period of about six weeks and ended up staying for an entire year. He also was big in New York City in the jazz scene. He had he had a loft in what's the Flower District. Um, this is one of the photographs sort of out the window of that loft. And he had rigged up microphones and cameras and stuff all around his apartment. And the big jazz people of the time would come to his apartment late at night after playing. They would jam in his loft of his where he would photograph them and record them and all of this sort of stuff. And then there is his most famous work um, that if you know anything of him, it's his work covering the Minamata and Minamata disease in Japan, um, which was basically a, a, the village of Minamata was poisoned by a company that was dumping heavy metal metals, particularly mercury, into the bay. The fish were, eat, were consuming the mercury, then the people were consuming the fish and getting mercury poisoning. Um, he is another one of my big influences. Um, Next, we have Gordon Parks, who was an African-American photographer, started out actually working for the Farm Security Administration, went on to photograph for life. A lot of his work um, on African-American life around the country. Um, this is Red Jackson. He was a Harlem gang leader. He did a series on them for Life magazine. Um, he did a lot of work on crime and punishment and the police and protests all sort of these very heavy subjects and his work is just absolutely phenomenal. I tried to pick a few here that aren't his typical work to give you sort of a view of some of the other things that he's done. His most famous photographs are so well known, but he doesn't get a lot of credit for some of the other ones. Um, I also fell in love with a lot of the war photographers from Vietnam. Um, this is Larry Burroughs, who's photo essay one ride with yankee papa 13 i still think and a lot of people agree with me is probably one of the single best photo stories ever put together in one time it was published in 1963 in life magazine if you have a chance i highly suggest looking that one up um this is another one of his more famous photographs from vietnam but so this is sort of the kind of these sort of documentary photographers that I was exposed to when I was in college and sort of have started really exploring their work after I graduated when I was in grad school and in between the time. Um, so I moved to New York right after graduating college at the Holy Cross in August of 1999. I had uh, my first gig out of college was actually working for the National Museum of the American Indian as a photographer photographing their collection as they were moving it from New York City, where it was stored, down to a new warehouse building in Washington, D.C., or just outside of Washington, D.C., um, and while I was there and was commuting is when I began sort of taking a lot of photographs in New York. And eventually I settled on the idea of photographing subway riders. As I was commuting, I started to take my cameras with me more and more often and photograph the people that I would run into on a daily basis riding the subway. Um, <clears throat> one, it was a way of making work around my sort of daily nine to five having to do a job and still be creative at the same time but i just thought it was a very interesting subject to explore at the same time and the way i would do it was i did not hide my camera everybody was sort of out in the open and i would tend to stay in one car in one spot per ride and sort of photograph what went on around me and it taught me two things one was how to wait for a photograph and see what was going on by following the people around me and how their movements and this kind of thing. And the second was the idea of getting up close and personal with somebody and photographing them without getting nervous about doing it. Um, this being New York City in the entire over the three years, basically, that I did this project, nobody actually ever confronted me about taking their photograph. The first one, that African-American man, I was probably less than a foot from his from him with a 28 millimeter lens. And if you can see by his eyes, he almost was purposely not looking at me because he just wanted to sort of ignore who I was and what I was doing there. Um, but it was a great teaching tool on how to get up close and personal in an unknown space with people that you don't know to photograph. Sorry. 
after a few years of this kind of work, um, of documenting the subways, I did my first sort of large scale international project, which also was my first exposure to life in Asia. I was working for a small publishing company down in Soho and caught the tail end of a story on the BBC about the Karen people, which is an ethnic minority that lives along the Thailand and Myanmar border in Southeast Asia. And there was a doctor there, they were interviewing a doctor who ran this clinic to care for the refugees that were sort of streaming out of Myanmar into Thailand to escape the fighting and the civil war and the, all the problems that were going on there. Uh, my father was a doctor. My mom's a retired nurse. I've always had a soft spot for these doctors that sort of set up clinics in crazy places of the world to, and try to take care of people simply because it's the right thing to do. And so after hearing the story and I had caught just a little bit of it, I managed to track down the clinic's email address and sent them a couple of emails and inquired about what was going on. And then eventually asked them if it was okay if I came to visit and make some photographs. And they said, that'd be great. So I bought myself a plane ticket with some of my college, uh, graduate school, school loans and flew over to Thailand for a month, um, not having actually, not speaking any Thai or Burmese and only knowing the person at the clinic through the email address. Um, when I was there, I was set up with one of the people that works at the clinic who speaks English, Thai, Karen, and Burmese. And he would shadow me all over both the clinic and anywhere else I went in town that I asked him to come along and would translate for me. So everybody knew what I was doing. I didn't want to be that guy taking pictures and people not understanding why this white guy is running around with a camera. This way I could communicate with everybody and ask them questions and they could ask me questions and that kind of thing. So this was this was fall, February and March of 2006 that I was there. Um, this first picture, this is the, the kitchen at the clinic. The clinic itself provides meals to all the patients and their families twice a day. So this is a man and his grandson in line for food. Um, this was a Muay Thai match that I went to one evening, um, which is Muay Thai, the sort of Thai kickboxing is a huge sport. And they sort of had a, there was a festival going on when I was there. And so they had these young, they had a, a bunch of matches at night and they allowed me to go up and photograph them from the side of the ring. Um, this was one of the patients at the clinic. The reason he's got his shirt pulled up is he was a sort of a retired Karen rebel fighter and he wanted to show off his tattoos which he believed would have saved him from bullets and hand grenades and protect him but if you look all those little black lesions that are on his chest are from aids at the time i was there in 2006 the burmese basically did not admit that aids existed as a disease anywhere so this man had shown up at the clinic not feeling good and they sort of had to tell him that he had this disease and there was nothing they could do about it because the, the medications were too expensive for the clinic to run, nor could they really get their hands on any of them. And then this is just another one from the town of Mesad, a man and his son riding along on a rickshaw as I was walking by. Um, when I came back from Thailand, again, I was sort of I, this work has been out and about a bit here and there exhibition wise and been published a few times. I then began a piece documenting Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn. Um, the reason I chose Myrtle Avenue is because I had I've so always been sort of an avid reader and I had picked up the Tropic of Cancer, the book, and in it is a passage um, it basically says that what Myrtle Avenue was like when it was written about in this book in the 20s is what Dante had in his mind when he wrote The Inferno. When somebody describes a place as this is what Dante saw when he wrote The Inferno, I decided I had to go out and check out what was going on out on Myrtle Avenue, just an area in Brooklyn. I don't live that far from there now. At the time, I was living in the Bronx. And I began to photograph the neighborhood, um, the section of the of the neighborhood written about in the book. This photograph I always show is sort of one of those funny, weird things that happens in life. The job I had at the, at the time when I was working on Myrtle Avenue, one of our interns saw this photograph and goes, hey, I know that guy 
who's riding the bike. He's a coworker of mine at Bed Bath and Beyond, I believe it was. You know, and I said, oh, fine. So I made him a print and I took it and he took it to the guy and the guy showed his wife and his wife. He's like, look, this, this photojournalist got a picture of me riding along Myrtle Avenue. And his wife got unbelievably mad at him because of all the things he's doing. If you notice, he's not wearing his helmet. It's hanging around his handlebars. She was not amused. Um, I, however, think it's a pretty good story. Um, this work has been, a lot of these photographs are in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York. Um, I spent basically three years in and out of Myrtle Avenue following it just to sort of see what would life was like along this stretch of Brooklyn. And after I finished with this work, um, the next big undertaking that I did was a piece called Muslim American, American Muslim, um, documenting Muslim American communities, both in New York City and then eventually sort of around the country. This project began because back in at the beginning of a, a group called the Muslim American Society wanted to build a mosque on Staten Island in Brooklyn. The idea was they were going to buy an abandoned convent from the Archdiocese of New York and convert it into a mosque and a cultural center. And when the people on Staten Island found out about this back in 2010, they went ballistic about it. Oh, it's going to become an Al-Qaeda trading camp. It's going to be home to terrorists, all this sort of stuff. And upon reading these stories in sort of the local New York City press about it, I contacted the Muslim American side. I said, look, I'm, I would be very interested in doing a piece about what what actually goes on in these mosques. Because a lot of these people, myself included, had never been in a mosque. I don't really know a lot of Muslims other than the guys I would buy my coffee from, from the street carts in New York City. Why is everybody complaining about this stuff when nobody knows what's going on? So I'm gonna go, well, I'd be interested in photographs. So they set me up with a mosque in Brooklyn. And I spent the first year of this project, which is still sort of ongoing, photographing this one group in Brooklyn. Um, this is one of the photographs I made on the, I guess this would have been the second night of Ramadan back in 2010 when I was there. Um, and as the project progressed and I started to show it more, I would travel more. So I would start to photograph Muslim communities in the areas that I was then traveling to. Um, so this is a mosque in uh, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. This is a all girls high school outside of Chicago. Um, this is a, a bunch of um, high school women praying at a school in Oklahoma. Um, this is a New York City police officer praying at what is known as the Park, City, uh, Park 51, otherwise known as or what, what is known as the Ground Zero Mosque. This was a mosque that was going to be built um, about two blocks from Ground Zero on the site of, an, of a Burlington coat factory that had basically been damaged during 9-11. Um, I was the first photographer that was basically allowed to go in and I photographed there for about six months over the course of a year. Um, the only reason they let me in is I was honestly the first photographer that had ever asked them to photograph what was going on in this mosque, that there had been so many protests and um, news stories and politicians were weighing in about it and all of this sort of thing. <clears throat> So as I, that's the end of that series. Um, there's plenty more of these photographs that I can also show you on my website at the end. Um, from this project, I also began to do a lot more work in Asia while I was working on the Muslim American Society pieces and a few other things. Um, in 2016, I was invited by a student that I had taught um, when I was in New York City who was Pakistani and had started his own photo school in Karachi, Pakistan, to come for a month, give a talk in Karachi and one in Lahore, and then sort of spend, a, I was roughly there for a month traveling around Pakistan photographing. Um, so this is sort of some of this series, I just call it what, is, what I saw in Pakistan. Um, this is one of the most Pakistani photographs I think I've ever made. Um, my Pakistani friends tell me the same thing because not only is it the kids on their dirt bikes and sort of which are big and ubiquitous around the city and the, the bad traffic that we're all trying to get through, but there's a girl riding a camel in the background, which is just sort of the, the duality of how modern Karachi is and how old school it is. And 
it's one of those cities where the traffic it's there'll be three lane roads but the people will be driving five cars apart and none of the traffic lights work and even the ones that do people don't really pay attention to so you're sort of taking your life in your hands the entire time you're driving it's an amazing country and it's an amazing place but it's it's very very like uh, there's a big duality in that in the country I only have a couple of Pakistan. Um, I thought I had another one. Sorry about that. The next body of work was um, from Hong Kong, which I've also traveled to numerous times to sort of photograph life going on in Hong Kong. The duality of the city between how it is during the day where it's a very sort of government and business, like big banking sector, all this sort of stuff during the day. And then at night, how it has sort of this very dark and can be somewhat seedy underside um between the expat bars and sort of just a lot of weird things going on um so this is the cab driver that was sleeping in his cab late at night walking the streets um this is one of the busy intersections in downtown an area called central at, at lunchtime during the week where everybody's trying to get everywhere they want to go they're mushing between the cars that are sort of stopped at an intersection and bad traffic to get there um at night you have the sort of this was taken outside of a bar in the Wan Chai area. The woman sort of works at one of the clubs, the way to get guys to come in and buy drinks. And she's just sort of outside having a cigarette. Um, this is one of the clubs on a Sunday where sort of the girls, the local singles are out sort of hanging around trying to pick up the expat guys that are living there. And this is one of the expat guys. Um, this is one of those places the only reason I was allowed to make photographs in there is I happen to have long story how, but I met the bar owner at another place and invited me to come over and take some photographs and sort of thing. Normally this stuff isn't always allowed. And this is an outdoor market during the day on a weekend. It was a Saturday. So it's just sort of this, everybody's out shopping and food shopping. And again, so much different between the day and the night of the city. And I've also done some work in Tokyo. I was there right before um, the COVID-19 outbreak. I was there in February of 2020 um, for an exhibition of my work and was sort of photographing what Tokyo was like. As I was there, the Black Diamond cruise ship was sitting in Tokyo Harbor, which had had a huge outbreak of COVID. And at the time, Japan wasn't letting anybody off the ship, but they all knew it was coming. And once people were off that ship, that it was going to become a problem. So I was sort of wandering around Tokyo photographing some of the subway, another sort of night scene. This is one of the smoking rooms where in Tokyo, in Japan in general, um, you can always smoke in designated areas mainly inside for some reason that all these ventilation shafts but they're always these sort of very dimly lit areas and it's these sort of business guys in their suits out photo out smoking so there we go okay and then now on to after that lo slightly longer than anticipated uh introduction this is i will start talking about my series mic check um so how to start about this. So this project began in November of 2014. Over the previous summer of that year, Michael Brown had been killed by the police in Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Garner had been killed by police on Staten Island in New York City. In, in late November, the grand juries came down in both cases, um, basically saying the cops did nothing wrong in the killing of these two African-American men. A friend of mine who was from Missouri and was living in New York basically told me like, look, when this comes down, there's going to be a lot of protests in the city, have your camera gear ready to go. So I did. So the day that the protests started in New York city, I got out of my teaching job around seven thirty, eight o'clock at night that night and immediately went to union square and people had immediately started to gather to protest what was going on. Um, so this is one of the photographs I actually got on the first night of photographing. Um, over the next months, it became an almost daily event in New York City that there were protests. Um, some of them, uh, this was in Times Square in early December. 
people, especially as it got closer to the holiday season, these crowds would gather in various parts of the city. They would march up to sort of the big shopping districts and sort of have sit-ins in the stores. Um, this was the Forever 21 that was in Times Square. That same night, um, they also took over the Disney store in Times Square. And this guy actually, as a photographer, he punched me. Um, I was to show this was the first time in my life of photographing I had ever been assaulted for doing the job. Um, and it was sort of back, this was back in 2014 before a lot of the fake news and sort of anti press things that happened now. And it had caught me completely off guard. I had turned to photograph this guy and sort of the people behind him as they were watching the protest inside the store. And as I turned, he swung his fist. And that's what's coming at me. And he hit me hard enough that he bent the metal lens hood of my camera. Um, but this also was sort of the first sign that I saw that covering these protests was could potentially be a much more difficult undertaking than I thought. Um, and as December went along, so this was a protest on the 19th of that year. Um, there was a Jericho walk, sort of walking seven times around one police plaza in lower Manhattan. It began at City Hall. Um, and these groups would just show up. And I, the way I was finding about about protests, and a lot of other people were at the time, was you would sort of follow Black Lives Matter on Twitter. You would see people would post, oh, this protest, people were meeting at this corner at this time. And you would go and there would be thousands of people. It was unbelievably how fast and how effective social media was at getting people to these protests. And this is 2016. And as these protests went, they got more and more and they would sort of ebb and flow for a long time in 2014, that first year. They went along the, up until right around Christmas time, little after New Year's, it was every week there was at least two or three, and then it would slow down. And then in the spring, when the weather would get nice, it would, there would be more. And then, unfortunately, as more names were also added to the list of African Americans that were killed by police or severely wounded by police, or unlawfully arrested, you've got like Freddie Gray and Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Flandre Castile. More and more, as soon as something happened, now it became an almost instantaneous thing that my twitter would light up with people all organizing protests um this one i also thought was interesting because they also in new york city for a while sort of became social events in a weird kind of way as well um i had shown up at this event that was one for a memorial for Fetty gray and as these protesters were marching and i was trying to get a photograph of the man in the sunglasses behind him these two this couple i'm assuming they're a couple sort of just literally just walked up in front of me, stopped, took a selfie of themselves in front of this giant crowd of protesters, and then marched off. It almost became like a thing to be seen at these protests, um, which occasionally still happens as well. But it was the first time I'd ever seen that kind of situation happen as well. Um, for, a, for a few weeks in 2016, this group that I was following in New York took over the park in front of um, City Hall in New York City. So there were all kinds of sit-ins, there were protests, there were speeches. The movement itself sort of went from one thing to another, and it wasn't just in Manhattan. This is up in Harlem. There was a pro there have been a series of protests over the years. Um, this is in Grand Central Station. Um, there were protests in Midtown and Downtown and Brooklyn. As more and more names came, more and more people would turn out. And I would start, I just carried my, I still do carry my gear all the time. And at a moment's notice, I'm all ready to go to photograph what's going on next. This was a protest specifically for Colin Kaepernick the year after he was sort of cut about trying to get him back on a team. Um, this was one that was in Columbus Square that had started with a um, movement to try to remove the Christopher Columbus statue from Columbus Square in New York City. This was one for when Philander Castile was killed. This is in, the, in Penn Station. And as I, the more that I did these and the, the people that would organize a protest would also, were also used to seeing me around, which also made me 
able to m make photographs, I think, in places that I otherwise might not have as a white guy. Because when the people that are running the protest know who you are and know that you're an okay person to have around and you're not going to do something crazy with the photographs, it sort of makes it a little easier. This is a protester that got arrested, that was arrested at a march um, in back in 2019. In 2019, in 20, the first part of 2020 was sort of an interesting time frame. By this point, the protest movement in New York City had started to die out. They would have protests, but there weren't as many people showing up. There weren't as many, luckily, as many events. So it was a lot of um, memorials for various people. This was for the fourth anniversary of the death of Sandra Bland. Um, but there weren't as many names being added to the list, which was good. But at the same time, it, and people were also getting burnt out on the protests themselves. I think it was a lot of marching and it didn't seem like a lot was getting done. People would have all these speeches and politicians were saying all this stuff, but nothing was really changing. And so originally I had decided that this particular night, which was the fifth anniversary of the death of Eric Garner was going to be sort of the last night of my project. I originally figured that this could, would be an interesting way to tie up what had happened in this five-year period. This is one of Eric Garner's nieces um, standing outside of the, the police precinct on Staten Island yelling at the cops who are sort of standing outside. Um, and then this was the fifth anniversary of the death of Michael Brown. And again, it was sort of, there was a crowd there that night, but it wasn't what it used to be. And there weren't as many people. And it was people you could tell were just after five years of ongoing protests were being worn. And then um, this is another one where they would confront officers and people were just yelling and screaming and this kind of thing going on. But again, it, the, a lot of those people in the background, if you look, aren't protesters. They're people that happen to be in Times Square sort of watching what was going on between this sort of this crowd, this smaller crowd of protesters and this overwhelming number of police that had shown up. And then um, in 2020, when George Floyd was killed and the video was released, New York City erupted. And part of it was people were home, people could come out and it, the crowds were just unbelievable how big and how powerful they became. And more and more um, as the summer went by and the spring went by and the summer went by in the fall, that it, it just kept on going. It also finally became to the point that people were actually and politicians were actually trying to get laws passed and do things and hold these police accountable. This was a crowd that showed up at a protest in front of the Brooklyn Museum, which is just down the street from where I live for supporting Black Trans Lives Matter, which I think is one of the largest protests in the city's history. The estimates from where about 15,000 people showed up that day. And they just kept going all through the fall, all, all through the spring and the summer and the fall. And then when Breonna Taylor was died and the grand jury left that, those cops off, it got, again, it was sort of people that were just so fed up with these things that had been tired before, the year before, just came rushing back with even larger crowds in the city. And then when Derek Chauvin was finally convicted of the death of George Floyd, it was sort of a giant release. And there was a big, it wasn't, I, I hate to call it a protest. It was sort of, it was a march, but it was in, it was almost like people were relieved that somebody had finally been convicted and held accountable for the events that, and effects of what they had done. And it's and the protests at the moment again have sort of died down again. Um, luckily or fortunately, they're I mean, the, the police in New York City and other events are still happening and they're still getting caught doing things they're not supposed to be doing. 
but it's it's a moment. It sort of is quieted down again for a little bit. I'm sure if there's more events and, and anybody else dies and there's things, this will come back yet again. Um, this was the last protest that I've been to so far this year, um, marking the one year anniversary of George Floyd. There was a big march that started in Manhattan, sort of marched over the Brooklyn Bridge into Brooklyn again. And it was it was sort of the, the biggest one of the last six months. But what's going to happen next, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out if I mean, I will continue to photograph protests as they happen, but with that sort of done at the moment, I'm also trying to slowly sort of wrap up and figure out what I can do now with this body of work that I have. Some of the protests that were smaller, um, there were occasionally times I was the only photographer there. So I have photographs of events that nobody else has, as opposed to these huge ones where there were lots of people. Um, so that's where that is. And I'm going to end this with the one photograph that sort of for a little hope of maybe what happened. That is um, Eric Gardner's daughter playing basically with a couple of friends of hers on the spot where her father was killed on the fifth year anniversary. Um, she was too young to remember her father much, but it sort of gives you hope that on these streets that maybe things can sort of come back together again and things can eventually heal. Um, and just so it's up here, this, if anybody, if you're too shy to ask a question in the chat or anything like this, this is my email address. Feel free to email me. Um, I'm pretty good at get, getting back to people relatively quickly. So if you have any questions, you don't want to ask them here, feel free to drop me a line. Great. And, um, Anthony is going to bring me back. Our wonderful media center technician is going to bring me back on to talk to Robert. Thank you so much. No Anthony, problem. Thank you, Robert. My um, pleasure. What's that? Sorry, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for giving that sense of an overview of your career, particularly because we know we have uh, photojournalism students who are going to be watching the talk. And so I was wondering initially, you dropped a couple of sort of breadcrumbs along the way about what was your nine to five while you were doing this photojournalist work. You mentioned first early on in your career, you were working for the American Indian Museum and later you yeah. mentioned being a teacher. So I wonder My, if you could just talk about what 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 has paid the bills as a photojournalist? Um, at the moment, and even currently, I make most of my money. Um, I have a couple of things. One, I still do photograph for museums in New York. Um, I currently am employed by one sort of as a job here and there. I'm not a, I'm trying to, I, I'm not allowed to tell you which one because they can't, it's like one of those kind of things. I was going to try to hint at it, but that has worked. I also write for a couple of outlets as well. Um, I write a piece on press freedom or press freedom issues around, particularly around Asia and China and Hong Kong, but also involving other areas of the world for the Hong Kong Free Press. I also write um, for Blind Magazine, which is a photography magazine. I do a lot of interviews with photographers about that, about their work or books that are coming out about their work and just sort of relating that to current events and social issues and that kind of thing. So it's sort of, and I've also taught in the past, it's sort of, it's always been sort of a mixed bag of various things that I do. And do you always, it sounds like you always have to be ready in the moment. You talked about like leaving your teaching job, it's eight or nine o'clock at night, but there's a protest and you need to be there. So mm -hmm. is there a sense of you are kind of always on if this is the path that you're Yeah, I always have, like, I mean, even now I walk to work in a museum where I don't need this stuff. I have three cameras with various lenses, a, like, I don't know, dozen rolls of film or so along with my press passes and everything else on the off chance that something happens, I've got to go out that night. Some nights I go home, some nights it's 2 a.m. Like you never know what, you sort of have to be ready to go. Great. So I know I have some questions about um, a body of your work. We have a question from one of our audience members, a mm -hmm. wonderful Fairfield University faculty member, Chris Seeley. Uh, who says, thank you for sharing your work with us. Can you talk about how you think through the question of audience? Do you think about who your story is for as you curate these bodies of work? Does that affect your process, your curation decisions, et cetera? That's, I mean, the idea behind my work and the stories that I do have always been about 
and I'm well aware of like, especially with something like Mike Check or the Muslim American series that can be very polarizing among people. Um, that the idea is like the photographs themselves, I'm not going to show my photographs and you're immediately going to have this aha epiphany that everything I thought was wrong and this is the right way to think about it. I see my work as a way for people to start talking about sort of these social events or in the case of like the work I did on the Karen in Southeast Asia about what is going on in parts of the world that most people are never going to get to go to. I mean, the, most people that go to Thailand are not going to end up where I was on the border between Thailand and Burma hanging out in a, with refugees in a refugee camp kind of area. So it's sort of about the idea of, I curate the work to sort of show what's going on in those places, but it's not like I have specific audience members in mind. I'm not curating it so that like, oh, this, like the Black Lives Matter is really gonna piss off the people that hate the Black Lives Matter movement or really super reinforces the people that are very pro the Black Lives Matter movement. It's sort of, this is a document of what happened those nights that I was there photographing. And some of them in the long run might end up being some sort of great historical photograph. Some of them you probably, you may never ever see again. It's sort of, but it's a way of starting a conversation about this, these subjects that I cover. That's sort of what I'm trying to do. So they're curated in that way if any of that made sense. Um, I think it did. I mean, yeah, I think it's, Chris will, will edit her question if she has more follow-ups, but yeah, it did actually- Yeah, more follow-ups, feel free to, if, if that didn't answer it, let me know. And anyone else listening, you know, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Luckily, I wrote down a whole bunch as you were talking. And one of them kind of um, dovetailed a little bit with what I think Chris was getting at. And it was, um, I noticed when you were talking, you are very clear to adopt a very neutral stance. You refer to, you mentioned, you know, the police shootings of Eric Garner and Philando Castile, but you refer to sort of these events, these incidents. And is that something that you've learned to adopt so as not to, as you say, pitch your projects toward a pro Black Lives Matter audience as opposed to one that might not support the movement? Is that something you have to kind of train yourself to maintain that level? Part of, of I mean, part of it is that, part of it is the idea of journalists are supposed to be neutral. None of us actually are neutral, but we have to, like, I have to, I mean, if I didn't care about the Black Lives Matter movement, I wouldn't have gone to cover it, if that makes sense. I'm not going to show, like, I'm not not showing, yeah, it's, I'm trying to be as neutral as possible, because again, it's one of those things, I want people to look at the work and have thoughts about it. I don't want to influence it too much, what people think when they see them. I want people to see them and have come up with their own thoughts versus me telling you this is super bad or this is super good, like kind of, it's a, it's a tricky line to walk though. Um, yeah, and Chris did um, come with a follow-up. She said, so do you see yourself as a witness with a responsibility of documenting? Yes. Okay. I consider myself, when, even when I'm at these protests, I am not a participant. I'm not a protester. I'm a journalist and a witness. It's sort of that old adage that journal, journalism and photojournalism is sort of writing the first draft of history. And it's that sort of thing. My job is to photograph what happens. And yet there has to be, I'm sure you take many more photographs in the actual oh, events have, than the ones that make it into the project. Yeah, so. I have thousands. And that's where that sort of, I also, as a journalist, do have an MFA as opposed to a degree in journalism. Mm. Whereas my work does... I do all of my work and stand by the journalistic standards. If I don't set up photographs, I don't edit them. Like they are what they are. At that same time, I also have that sort of art, arty history background of like looking at Robert Franklin, like the art photographs and trying to like, well, this is sort of an arty photograph of a journalistic subject. And sort of that line between the two is sort of what I'm, um, where I sort of fit. But it's a, it's a weird line to walk. Mm -hmm. Because for some journalists, I'm too arty. For a lot of artists, I'm a little too much of a journalist because the work's not about me and it's this like black and white film I'm shooting. So it's like this weird sort of intersection. And have you ever shot in color? Or have you always preferred black and white? I fell in love with black and white film when I was in college. It was sort of back then it was before digital cameras and all this sort of stuff. Um, and going into the darkroom and developing the film and then making the prints with it in larger, I just sort of fell in love with the process and I've always kept that process for my own personal work. 
um, my day job at the museums and all this other stuff, like I do very high end digital, I mean, 100 megapixel digital medium format camera backs and studio lighting. And like, I can do all of that sort of stuff. But growing up looking at the work of like Gene Smith and Gordon Parks and these sort of these master photographers and there, I've always just liked that look, which is why I've chosen to do it, which is that other sort of art versus journalistic thing that I do. That's way more arty than most journalists are. I always get, there's always a generally a couple of like journalists that are at these protests that will take pictures of me with my like laughing at me with my old school cameras, kind of weird mech, so. Oh, that's it. And since, as you say, you know, usually the, the photographer is not in the image. So I yeah. couldn't tell you offhand what an old fashioned rig would look like versus one that is clearly <laughs> well, a you know, I mean, CNN journalist. Yeah, honestly, I have, I generally shoot with three Nikon F cameras. The newest one dates from 1970. Oh, so okay. the cameras are older than me. These are the cameras that people use during the Vietnam War to photograph the Vietnam War. Um, they are tanks, which is the other reason that I use them. There's no light meter in them. There's no battery in them. They sort of work no matter what you do to them. So the at a protest where you could get jostled around and they could get dropped or banged into, I don't worry as much about them not working. And were you carrying one of those cameras when you were punched at that protest <laughs> yeah it was one with a 28 millimeter lens that the guy hit me with and again yeah i mean they're they called them hockey pucks when they came out because they're basically indestructible so it, it survived um, the incident in other words oh, okay and those the nikons i've shot now i've also used other nikon models over the years i've shot with leicas here and there cameras to me are a tool i am not stuck with oh this camera is the best camera ever or that camera is the best camera ever you use what tool is best for the job and if it happens to be a nikon that's fine if it happens to be a leica that's fine too it doesn't it's more about what works for the situation you're in that might answer um, some budding budding journalists or photojournalist questions about whether they should be investing in a particular type of camera at this point in their college in, career in terms of that my theory is this always buy the best lenses you can but the cheapest body because mm. the body is digitally or film will always go out of style. The lens is what really is the most important part in getting nice, sharp, good images. So if you have a choice of spending the money on a really fancy body or a really fancy lens, I've always said go for the lens. So coming back to uh, the black and white photography, uh, we had another question about, I also had a question about the choice to document in black and white. To my mind, it speaks to the commitment to be in quotes, an objective witness, as opposed to adding some sort of personal agenda. Am I off in that reading? And this is Chris uh, Seeley, the faculty member who asked the oh, earlier okay. questions. Um, wait, repeat that again? Uh, she, it sounds to me like she's wondering if you shoot in black and white because right. that speaks to the commitment to be an objective witness, as right. opposed to if you shot in color, perhaps adding some kind of agenda. Yeah, I don't know if adding color, I just wanted to make sure I heard that right. I don't know if adding color adds an agenda to anything. I mean, I know some great photographers that have been shooting the, these protests in color and everything else. I don't think that necessarily adds an agenda to the work that they do. It's just a different style of documenting things, I think is sort of what it is. Okay. And again, coming back from the background of the artists I was introduced to in college and grad school and that sort of the look of the old Life magazine stuff, that's sort of why I do the black and white. It's not so much that I'm trying to make a statement with it. I just like the way that it looks. And it does, I mean, especially at night, it does allow me to photograph in ways that I couldn't necessarily if I was using color film. And it gives it a different oh. look than the digital. Interesting. Yeah. So bringing it back from the, the material artifact to the individuals who you photograph in these series, um, I was interested when you talked about your early strap hanger series in New York, the idea that no, not a single New Yorker, you know, said anything about sure. being photographed, including very up close, it's classic New York attitude, just keep, ignore it. Yeah, nobody <laughs> nobody life. wants to get involved with somebody they don't know. But I did wonder, um, well, first of all, I had a couple of questions. One was at that time you weren't wearing a press pass, right? You weren't identifying right. yourself as a as a journalist. No, because I wasn't. I didn't have one at the time. Yeah. Right. And I was wondering how it changes when you photograph. Like when you're at the protest, are you always wearing some sort of identifier press pass? I, I know you do, said that they got yeah, to know I you. Yeah, I have. I have two. I have one from the uh, National Press Photographers Association, and then I have the big white square one from the city. 
um, that sort of points out that New York Police Department issues them so that the police, basically the idea is that the police, if they see you wearing one of these things, they know you've been vetted and you're not, I don't know what they think you could be, but that's, so they know. And I wondered, um, you know, obviously we know if you're out in a public place, you have no, you know, you've given up your expectation of privacy, I think is the phrase that's legally used. But I wonder how you would react, aside from the guy who hit you that time, if someone came to you and identified themselves as being in one of your photographs and said that it made them uncomfortable or potentially unsafe to have been identified, would you take any action if someone said that? It's this, there's, there's actually, I have two stories about this. So people have after i've taken pictures asked hey if i'm in that don't use it and that's fine like if somebody really doesn't want it i'm sure i have enough other photographs from the night the one that i have of you in it i won't use um and i've had and you can sort of sometimes tell when you're setting up especially in these crowds you'll see people the way they look at a photographer that they're sort of not comfortable with where that lens is going. And you can see them sort of like, you sort of have to read facial expressions a little bit. And if I can visibly see that somebody seems to be slightly uncomfortable, I'll sort of let that one go too. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. Um, I had a guy one time, I took a picture and his first reaction was immediately asked me to delete the picture. And I said, no, it's on film. Then he demanded the role of film. And I said, I'm not giving you the role of film. Like, it's not going to happen. And I use that. You're in a public space. If you think I'm the only one out here taking pictures, you're kind of crazy. Um, and he sort of backed down and went away. I'm much more. The only reason I got to that level with him is, like, if he had been nice about it, I would have been like, look, don't worry. I'm not going to use it. Whatever. If you ask me to do it ahead of time or sort of show that you're not, but if you're going to try to confront me, about it that's where it's just sort of like that's not the greatest move in the world but in general if somebody tells me they don't want their picture printed or like again i won't do it it's not that big of a deal that guy in particular i do have one photograph that he's in it was sort of a crowded thing if you didn't know who it was you wouldn't have recognized him anyway um but that has become more of a thing in new york and other places too about that try to protect the protesters by not showing faces I'm not a big proponent of that because one, my job is to tell a story, not necessarily. If you're at a protest in a public space, you're going to be photographed. And first of all, me with my film camera, that's going to take me a week to get the film back. It's you're not like, I'm not going to get you in trouble. Most of the journalists aren't going to get you in trouble. The thing is all the cops in New York city all have camp like video cameras and videotape the protests. There are so many security cameras in New York city that you're going to get the journalists aren't the ones that are going to get the protests in trouble in general, if they're, if they go to that level where that becomes an issue. And that um, I'll let Chris have the final question here because it relates to what you were just saying when you told that gentleman that you can't delete a frame from a a film roll. She asked if you could talk about your decision to use film instead of working digital. It's just, again, because I'm old school. Um, Again, I grew up, like when I was in college, it was all film. And I really enjoy working in the dark room. I like making prints. I like sitting there in the sort of dull red light. And to me, it's still magic. Every time you expose the paper and you put it in the velvet, you shake it, the picture starts to come up. I still think that is like the coolest thing in the entire world that it actually works that way. Um, I have no problem with people that use digital. I have no, nothing against digital. It's again, it's, I just like the look of how the black and white silver prints look and the idea of using film in that way. And it's not, it's more of a, that's again, one of those more artistic personal choices. And at the same time, I'm not, because of the way I work in general, sort of more longer term photo stories and essays, I'm also not trying to get myself published in the newspaper the next day. I tend to pitch to magazines where I have more of a lead time. So I just did a piece actually for GQ Japan that they wanted me to do some photography in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And again, I got to do film for that because their deadline, these magazines know six months in advance what's coming up. So you have the time to do that. I'm not looking to take pictures and get them in the New York Times tomorrow. Right. And the interest in darkroom photography clearly is 
um, represented a growing amount of interest, I think, among students because Fairfield Studio Art Program actually just added a darkroom, I think, last ah, year. After that's not good having had for one. years, I would yeah. go to schools to do talks and lectures with various things, and they would tell me, oh, we just took out our darkrooms, and darkrooms were sort of disappearing. But over the last couple of years, well, at least pre-COVID when I was still traveling, um, yeah, it was. it's definitely seems to be coming back. And maybe we could end with if you had any words of advice for those in the audience, whether they're interested more in the art side of photography or the journalistic side, what would you say to a student? I mean, this is going to not sound harsh, but it's get a day job. Um, only because everybody and I was the same way. I was like, I'm going to graduate college. I'm going to take my camera and I'm going to start like working for the New York Times. This is going to be phenomenal. Not like the, the chance of that happening right upon graduation is slim. The chance of you being able to make enough money off of your artwork right out of school is slim. I'm not saying don't try. I'm saying contact every photo editor you know if you're a photojournalist, if you're into writing more of that sort of stuff, contact people, write them, show them samples, try to line up a lot of stuff. A lot of work these days is going to be freelancers, <clears throat> um, which you don't get a lot of the benefits like medical benefits, all this sort of stuff. We're doing that thing. Retirement, start planning for retirement. Um, that's another one that like, I didn't catch on to that till I was in like my early thirties and that was a mistake. Um, those kinds of things, but, but be prepared to have a day job and find a way of being creative and doing your work around having to do a nine to five. I think those are great words of advice. Thank you so much for taking us through your process, through the history of your career. And I just want to reiterate to those watching that Rob's show, uh, Robert Gerhardt Mic Check, is on view in the Bellarmine Hall galleries through December 18th. You can visit it from Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. I hope you will stop by. For more information, you can go to fairfield.edu slash museum slash Robert Gerhardt and see some more of the images from the exhibition. And again, uh, if people have Robert, questions, yeah, feel free to use my email address. I check it all the time. I'm good about getting back to you. So yeah, feel free to drop me a line anytime. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you. Nope, oh, I guess we're we're good to go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anthony.